You ever been out fishing on a rough day or on a boat on a rough day and you get back on the shore and you still feel like you're on the boat? How many of you ever done that one? Now, I have no idea what it was like to, for example, be a pilgrim coming to America or to be somebody like Rodney talked about who's out at sea and has no idea where they're at. But I learned something this week, uh, what True North is and how we kind of figured out how to navigate. And here's the picture I want to show you real quick. So this is the night sky time-lapsed, if you didn't know. And if you look right in the middle, uh, uh, right in the middle there is Polaris. And that's not just a cooler that you buy or a boat. I think there's a couple other name, things named Polaris. It's a star. And it's what we call the North Star. And you'll notice even the North Star moves just a little. It actually does a, a small circle. It's not quite exact. But the truth is, for uh, a couple of thousand years now, that has been what mariners, or at least hundreds of years, that's what mariners have used uh, in order to judge where they are. Apparently you can, and, and by the way, I have no idea how to do this. Uh, but apparently you can get a fixed point with a sextant on, a, on the North Star, and then there's other stars they use to know where they are or an idea of where they are. And then you need an accurate clock on top of that, which they used to not even have that, which is crazy. Can you imagine? You're on a ship and they've got a sand dial. Those work so good when you guys are playing that game that you forget to turn it over. Uh, uh, what is that, categories or something where you have to turn the thing over and nobody remembers and it runs out? I'm sure that happened on boats too. Like, what time is it? Oh, hang on. No idea, right? And, and here's the thing. I don't know how your week was, but I, I had the kind of week where there were a lot of times this week that I felt dizzy, out of control. What is going on? I heard about the, the shooting in Texas and I went, what? And then, of course, all my friends, I have lots of different friends who have lots of opinions who are going to convince each other on Facebook of what needs to be done. That's such a great venue to try to convince friends that you're right and they're wrong and you're smart and they're dumb. I actually had somebody cuss at me. That was fun. And so I want you to know that uh, I understand when you feel out of sorts. And maybe this week, your week was like my week where the doctor uh, I thought I was going in for an appointment. I thought, okay, this is what's going to happen. He's going to tell me A, B, C. And the doctor went, L. And I went, what? I don't like L. Can we do A, B, C? I was ready for A, B, C, not L. Nope, L. Okay. Maybe you got some news. Maybe you had something happen this week. Maybe it was a struggle for you, a personal issue. Maybe it's a deal that's going on at work, or maybe it's a family member, and you're, you're feeling, you don't feel like the North Star. You feel like you're outside spinning in circles, and you're trying to figure out, what do I do? So we're going to come back to one theme today. Paul talks about this idea that all he wants to think about and focus on is Christ crucified. You know, there was an old song when we were kids, and it it went like this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's very simple words, Jesus loves me, and I love the sign uh, uh, for Jesus. Did you know the, the sign language for Jesus is the nail prints in the hands? It's a reminder of what Jesus did for us, and why did he do it? John three sixteen. because God loves us. And so, if your world this week, if you're kind of frustrated about everything and stressed out about everything. By the way, just to give you a little side note, one of my pastor friends called me this morning. They had a death threat at their church this morning. So when those things happen, what do you do? You know, maybe you'll get a call this week that'll kind of throw you off. What do you do? You have to go back, back to the cross, to true north. I know that this week it's been hard to do that, but we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 today, and we're going to talk about how we can keep our bearings in this crazy world. And I'm going to give you three practical ways this week when things happen or you're feeling a certain way that you, you can remember, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Why does that matter? Why is, it, why is that important? And I'm going to give you three practical ways to do it. So we're going to look at the value 
of Jesus Christ crucified. Here's the first thing that we struggle with. When I feel inadequate, everyone feels inadequate sometimes. You, you typically have one or two defaults that you do. You either feel inadequate. You feel like you don't measure up to other people. You know, they, they, you, you look and you go, wow, they're awesome and I'm not. I'm, I'm not, you know, and I told my wife this week, I said, listen, if you ever feel like I'm so much smarter than my husband, I just want you to know you're right. We're just going to get that out of the way. This is not a competition. I lose. Except in cholesterol. Anyway, okay, so, right, right? You got to have something you win. You have something, something you have nothing to do with is the only thing I can win at. And so when you see somebody who seems to be so much better at you than something, they, they, sometimes you feel like I don't measure up. Oh, but we like the other extreme too. When we think our opinion's right and somebody else is wrong and we're on Facebook, we're like, what an idiot you are. Oh, you think you're going to solve that problem that simply by just changing this one thing? You are an idiot. You think you'll change it that way with your one rule? Well, I got a new rule. This is my rule, and that'll fix it. I'm so much better than you. And we struggle with one or two ways of not measuring up. We either feel inadequate or we feel superior to other people, and both of them are wrong. You know, in Acts chapter 17, Paul got in a debate with philosophers, and it's really interesting because... He reaches out to try to win people to Jesus, and he realizes that no matter how many arguments he uses, it doesn't matter. So in 1 Corinthians, here's what he says to this church in Corinthians, in Corinth, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And so it was with me, Paul says, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, time out. I, I got to tell you about this Paul dude, okay? This Paul dude was trained by this guy named Gamaliel. If you go to a rabbi today and say, have you ever heard of Gamaliel? They'll say, yes, he was the, the final oral law rabbi. That was Paul's teacher. It would be like me saying, Einstein was my math teacher. And anybody who knows my math skills knows that's a lie. That is an absolute lie. You're using a finger still for stuff, right? But, but when Paul says, I come with no wisdom, it wasn't that he couldn't. But he knew what was most important. He knew that the center of everything was God's love in the cross. And that for us, really has to go back to center when you're feeling out of control and when you get news that you don't like and when you're overwhelmed because, by the way, we are not created to know what's going on everywhere in the world at one time. We're the only generation that literally can know right now. We can get an alert on our phone to tell us something on the other side of the world that happened right now. And you get caught up in all that and you get dizzy. And then Paul continues, I came to you in weakness. You ever feel that way? And great fear and trembling. You ever feel so inadequate that you're afraid? That you actually shake? My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration, what? Of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. See, there's a lot of people this morning that they think that God's going to love them more if they do fill in the blank. I came to church today. God loves me more today than he did yesterday. Nay, nay. I gave money at church. God loves me more than he did yesterday. Nay, nay. The pastor maybe. But nobody else. By the way, I don't know what anyone gives. I was being funny. All right. You may think your status as a person makes you valuable. You may think your job makes you valuable or less valuable. You may think the money in your bank, whether it has a comma or no comma, right? You may have a bank account that has no comma. I've had no comma days. Have you had no comma days? You go to the bank, you're like, oh no. You're trying to figure out how to get it down to pennies, right? You ever done that one? Oh. You forget about a check you wrote? Ever done that one? That's fun. If, you're, if your significance is based on what's in your bank account, it's going to fluctuate all the time. God's love does not fluctuate. It's by 
the Spirit's power. Even Paul said, it's not about my wisdom. It's not about my state. He's a Roman citizen, a Greek. They had the best philosophers, the best architecture, the best learning, the best everything of the time. And Paul said, none of that matters. You're not important because of all the things you think are you. You know what the first question people ask when they meet each other is? What do you do? You know why? Because we somehow try to relate to people based on what they do. I hate to tell people I'm a pastor. Peter Lord did too. He used to tell people he was a professional lover. It's a really weird thing to say to people. You ought to see reactions on that one. I haven't done that yet. As I get older, maybe. So here's what I want you to do this week. Recognize that you have God's power. And here's what I want you to do when you feel disoriented this week. You're overwhelmed because you've, you're, you're seeing things in the news. You're watching a court case between celebrities over and over again. Or you're, or you're... Was there something that happened this week that I'm not aware of? Maybe, maybe this tragic news and you start getting overwhelmed and you think, God, where are you? I want to encourage you. Here's your practical thing to do. I want you to, you ready for this? Go for a walk. Paul said that you have God's power. And so when you walk around and you see how awesome the world is. I mean, maybe you have a bird feeder. The older you get, the more exciting that is. But as you recognize how awesome God's creation is, recognize that the God who with his power created all things, the stars in the heavens, gave you his power. And so receive that. God, I need your power today. I feel weak. I feel dizzy. I'm just exhausted. Lord, I don't have answers for all this stuff. God, it's confusing. My friends are against each other over this, this issue. And I don't know what I think. I kind of think both things. But thank you for your power. God, would you give me your power? Would you help me to focus on what really matters in the world. By the way, the news every week is going to have something different for you to focus on. Have you not figured this out yet? They're just trying to sell you food and commercials. So every week they've got to give you some crisis. Even, I hate to say this, even Christian organizations four times a year are going to have a crisis. You know why? Because they figured out four times a year they can get you to give. If they tell you there's some big thing you got to give to right now, you watch your mail and look for it. I knew a guy who was in marketing for a Christian advertiser and he told me that one day and I went, Huh? So even Christians do it. Back to the cross. Back to God's love for you. Jesus loves you. When you take a walk, say, the God who created all these things loves me. I love what Louis Giglio says. Admitting we are not God, not in control, not running anything, not responsible for everyone's well-being, not the solution for everything and everyone, not at the center of all things, does not belittle us. It frees us. You cannot control those people in your life, especially on Facebook. All right, number two, when I don't understand. I, I, I was made to feel dumber than I've ever felt, ever, when I saw this book, Calculus for Dummies. So I thought, huh, I'm a dummy. Let's look at the book. Oh, no. Method two, the quadratic formula. I'm beyond the dummy. I'm lower. I need a book for dummy, dummy, dummies. Right? You ever feel dumb? You ever feel like you don't understand something? <laughs> you ever had somebody not understand you? You said something and you're like, that is not what I meant. But that's what you said. Oh, yeah. Uh. This is what Paul says. He had the same thing happen. <clears throat> we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of the age who are coming to nothing. By the way, do you ever think about that? That means politicians are coming to nothing. Isn't that nice to know? It's just, you just need to take that verse and read that and realize that all these politicians you think are important one day will not be here. All these politicians you think, oh, that's the best person in the world. When you get to heaven, you're going to be like, you did what? Oh, no. So Paul says early on, hey, they're coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and God destined for our glory. I love this, before time began. None of the politicians understood it. 
For if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who, what's the next two words? Love him. Do you realize what God's prepared for you when you love him? You're, you're listening to these people who, who will not have a future and God's love never ends. He's prepared more than you'll ever be able to think about. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them, right? Because you say to the pastor, oh, I'm glad to help. And then you get in the car and you go, I can't believe I agreed to help. Sure, I'll help you move. Love to. I can't believe I said yes to them. I, right? Right? So the Holy Spirit knows. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we've received is not the Spirit of the world. Anger, fear, frustration. You fill in the blanks. But the Spirit who's from God. So that we may understand what God has freely given us. And so what do you do? This week, when, when people are stressed about everything, and some of it, listen, some of it's worth stressing about. You should be very upset about kids getting killed in a school. And you should be okay going, I kind of think this might help, but I don't know, and it's okay to be that way. And when you get overwhelmed with something, maybe there's a, something in your life, and you're having to deal with a problem, or you've got to go and address it, and you don't know exactly what you should do, it's okay, listen, it's okay to be okay not knowing exactly what to do sometimes. But recognize this. God, would you give me wisdom? And not wisdom because you deserve it, but wisdom because he loves you. God, I need your wisdom. So here's the second practical thing I want you to do. Next time you need wisdom, instead of focusing on what you need wisdom for, take a walk and just begin giving thanks. Just begin giving thanks. Why? Because that makes you a wise person. You know what that does? That makes you have gratitude. And you know what gratitude does? Gratitude helps you to relax and realize what I think is a big deal is probably not as big of a deal as I am. And guess what? I'm still here, so apparently I made it through a few other crises. God, thank you for what you've done. God, I need your wisdom in this next one. Here it comes. Lord, I see it coming. i got to deal with this. I don't want to deal with it. Lord, thank you for what you've done in the past. Thank you for what you've done in my life. By the way, if you're like me and you're an unfocused person, use the alphabet to help you give thanks. Start with A and go to Z. And when you get lost at M, you just come back. Where was I? Oh, yeah. I was thanking God for moose. Why is it not mooses? Anyway, number three, when I'm not accepted. You ever feel unaccepted? I was on the track team and I ran the 440 relay. When I was a freshman, I got to run with the seniors one year, and I messed up the exchange, and they never let me run with them again. I felt rejected. I didn't get to run again until my junior year, even though I was the fastest student in the school from 10th grade up. You have a baton. God has poured out his love for you, and your job is to pass that love and acceptance on to other people. Now, acceptance is very different than accepting behavior. If you have grandchildren, you understand this. You totally accept your grandchildren, but sometimes they do stuff, and you're like, oh, no. Can we accept and love people? Paul's words were not always accepted. He felt un accepted. He actually, after he left Athens, talks about he was dejected. So in 1 Corinthians, it continues, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom and in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Listen, there are times that you're trying to convince somebody that God is real. Or you're trying to convince somebody that Jesus loves them and you're speaking a different language. But I can tell you that a language that everyone understands is God's love. So sometimes you just love people. It you, you, doesn't mean you don't tell them about God's love. It doesn't mean you don't tell them about who Jesus is. But it means that sometimes you recognize 
Only the Spirit can pull them towards Him. I am not in charge of that. By the way, you can't make anybody do anything. Did you know that? If you haven't figured that out yet, you don't have a teenager or a three-year-old. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. Why? For who has known the mind of the Lord to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I want to remind you, the Bible says you have the mind of Christ. But here's what happens. We get so involved in the mind of the world that we begin thinking like the world. How are we going to fix this? How's this going to happen? Oh, I got to worry about that. Oh, no, the economy. Oh, my retirement. Oh, gas prices. Oh, 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 right? And they're just selling commercials. They love to sell you commercials. That's all they're doing. They're selling commercials. And you take it hook, line, and sinker, and you are freaked out. Why? Because you had the mind of Christ, but you began allowing the thoughts of the world to take over. Lust and anger and frustration and greed and pride and selfishness. So get your Bible out. When you feel out of kilter, if you want to go back to true north, get your Bible out and see what God says about you. See what God says about what matters. You read John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You have an eternal destiny. So the things that happen to you this week are small potatoes, Paul says. He doesn't say potatoes. But they're small compared to eternity. No matter what suffering you're going through now, it's small compared to eternity. Why? Because of what he said earlier. Because what God has planned for us is so much better. You ever had just an awesome day where you were maybe sitting on the beach? Maybe you were watching a sunrise or a sunset, and all of a sudden you were just overwhelmed with just, wow. Listen, that's just a touch of heaven. Exactly. That's just a taste. That's just a taste. That's Jesus calling. You might want to get it. That's just a taste of what God wants to give you. That's just a touch of what God wants to give you. And so the next time you're overwhelmed with life and overwhelmed with what's happening and you're, you're spinning and you, and you can't get your bearings and you feel like you just got off a boat, hey, get out God's word. Take some time to give thanks. Think, take some time to realize how awesome God's power is and rest in the cross. You can't earn your way to God. The reason Jesus came to us is because we couldn't get there. You can't earn your way to him. You simply surrender to him. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you can do that today. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm messed up. I know I'm broken. And I surrender my life to you. I lay everything at your feet and I want to follow you. The Bible says that when you pray that prayer or you make that commitment in your heart, that he exchanges your sin for his righteousness. Not because you deserved it. That's how good God's love is. That's why Paul, as smart as he is, said, I don't rely on my wisdom. So if you're here today, whatever you're struggling with today, lay it at the feet of the cross. Go back to true north. Quit following all the things the world tries to get you to follow. Recognize his majesty in your life. And you will find that you'll live a life of peace, a life of joy in a world that's full of anger and frustration and fear. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you that you accept us, you love us, that because of your love for us, we measure up with you. And Father, you've given us the task of passing on your love to others, so help us to do that. Lord, I pray for that one here who's burdened, that Father, even now, they would know your presence and your love. Lord, I pray for that one maybe here or online that has never surrendered their life to you. Lord, I pray that they would begin to ask you to reveal yourself to them. Lord, I thank you that you've done that over and over again. Thank you for those who've taken steps of faith through baptism. I pray we would continue to take steps of faith in whatever you want us to do next. In Jesus' name, amen.